Our conversation is with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov. Second, when I started working for the Soviet Embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind. That my country brings to India not freedom, progress, and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation, and slavery, and, and, and of course economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which by KGB standards is an extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty. When an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country, I literally fell in love with this beautiful country, a country of great contrasts, but also great humility, great tolerance, and, and if philosophical and intellectual freedoms. My ancestors used to live in caves and eat raw meat when India was a highly civilized nation 6,000 years ago. So obviously the choice was not to the advantage of my own nation. I decided to defect and to entirely dissociate myself from that brutal regime. Crazy. Uh, first of all, because defecting in India is virtually impossible. Thanks to very strong pressure from the Soviet government. Excuse me, you were in India, India. on assignment at yes, that time. Yes, I was working for the Soviet embassy in New Delhi as a press officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, defecting for a Soviet diplomat is next to impossible. It's a suicide, as I said, because a great friend Indira Gandhi um, pushed a law through parliament which says, and I quote, no defector from any country has a right of political asylum in any embassy on the territory of Indian Republic, which is a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but the Soviet one needs a political asylum. So knowing that perfectly well, I, I, I planned a craziest possible way to defect. I studied contraculture in India. There, are, there were thousands of young American boys and girls with no shoes, long hair, smoking hush and marijuana, studying sometimes uh, Indian philosophy, sometimes simply pretending that they study. And they greatly annoyed Indian police and they were laughing stock of Indians uh, because obviously they, they were good for nothing students. I studied carefully where they congregate, what routes they travel, what language they speak, what do they smoke. And one day I simply joined a group of hippies to avoid detection of Indian police. I was dressed as a typical hippie with uh, blue jeans, uh, long kameez shirts with all kinds of nice decorations like beads, long hairs. Uh, I, I, I bought a wig because for several weeks I had to turn myself from a conservative Soviet diplomat into a very progressive American hippie. My first assignment was to India as a translator with the Soviet Economical Aid Group building refinery complexes in Bihar state and Gujarat state. At that time I was still naively, uh, idealistically believing that what I was doing contributes to the understanding and cooperation between the nations. Uh, it took me quite a number of years to realize that what we were bringing to India was a new type of colonialism, thousand times more oppressive and exploitative than any colonialism or imperialism in, in history of mankind. Uh, but at that time I was still hoping that, well, maybe it's not that bad, could be worse, and things may go for better. And I even tried to implement the beautiful Marxist motto, proletarians of all the countries unite. I tried to unite with a nice Indian girl <laughs> and I was, actually I was fascinated by Indian culture, by, by the family life in, in this country. Of my first assignment in India, I was promoted to the position of, of public relation officer. You can see me here translating a speech by a Soviet boss. And on, you're on the right. I'm right? on the right here, yes. Mm -hmm. and. It was, the occasion was commissioning of the refinery complex in Bihar, Barauni. Another uh, area of activity when I was working for the Novosti was to accompany groups of so-called progressive intellectuals, writers, journalists, publishers, uh, teachers, professors of, of, of colleges, 
he, you can see me here in Kremlin, I'm second on, on the left, with a group of Pakistani and Indian intellectuals. Uh, most of them pretended they don't understand that uh, we are actually working on behalf of the Soviet government and the KGB. They pretended that they are actually being guests, a VIP intellectuals, that they are treated according to their merits and, and, and their intellectual abilities. For us, they were just a bunch of political prostitutes to be taken advantage for various propaganda operations. Therefore, you can see perfectly well the senior colleague of mine on the left doesn't really have that much respect on his face. And myself, with a very skeptical smile, uh, typical KGB sarcastic smile, anticipating another victim of, of ideological brainwashing. This is how a, a typical uh, conference in Novosti headquarters in Moscow looked like. Uh, the, sitting in the middle is Boris Burkov, the then director of Novosti Press Agency, high-ranking party bureaucrat in the Department of Propaganda. I am standing next to a famous Indian poet, Sumitranandan Pant. Uh, he was famous because he was an author he was the author of a famous poem titled Rhapsody to Lenin. That's why he was invited to USSR and everything was paid uh, by the Soviet government. Uh, pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. This is one of the ways to kill the awareness or curiosity of, of foreign journalists. My, one of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. I had to take them to the VIP lounge and toast to friendship and understanding between the nations of the world. Glass of vodka, then the second glass of vodka. And in no time, my guests would be feeling very happy. They would see everything in kind of pink, nice color. And uh, that's the way I, I had to keep them permanently for the next 15 or, or 20 days. At certain point in time, I had to withdraw alcohol from them so that some of them who are the most recruitable would feel a little bit shaky, guilty, trying to remember what they were talking last night. That's the time to approach them with all kind of nonsense such as joint communique or statement for, for Soviet propaganda. Uh, that's the time they are the most flexible. And of course, what they didn't understand, they didn't realize or pretended not to realize that myself who was drinking together with them uh, was not drinking at all. I had ways to get rid of alcohol through various techniques, including special pills which were given to me by my colleagues. Uh, but they were taking it seriously. In other words, they, they, they would consume quite a large volumes of alcohol and feel quite uneasy next morning. This is the first stage of befriending a professor. You can see myself on the left with the same James Bond smile. On, my, on the right is my KGB supervisor, Comrade Leonid Mitrokhin, and in the middle, a professor of political science in Delhi University. The next stage would be to invite him to a gathering of Indo-Soviet Friendship Society. There he is sitting next to his wife before he is being sent to USSR for free trip. Everything is paid by the Soviet government. He was made to believe that he is invited to USSR because he is a talented, sober-thinking intellectual absolutely false. He is invited because he is a useful idiot, because he would agree and subscribe to most of the Soviet propaganda cliché. And when he is coming back to, to his own country, he is going for years and years to teach the beauties of Soviet socialism to uh, newer and newer generations of his students, thus promoting the Soviet propaganda line. Part of the building of USSR embassy and my supervisors on the left is Comrade Mehdi, an Indian communist, and on the right, Comrade Mitrohin, my supervisors in the secret department of research and counter-propaganda. It has nothing to do with either research or counter-propaganda. Most of the activity of that department was to compile huge amount, volume of information on individuals who were instrumental in creating public opinion. Publishers, editors, journalists, uh, actors, educationalists, professors of political science, members of parliament, uh, pre uh, representatives of business circles. Most of these people were divided roughly into groups. Those who would tow the Soviet foreign policy, they would be promoted to the positions of power through media and public opinion manipulation. 
those who refuse the Soviet influence in their own country would be character assassinated or executed physically come revolution under the guidance of, of the Soviet embassy in Hanoi. And same thing I was doing in New Delhi. To my horror, I discovered that in the files where people were doomed to execution, there were names of, of pro-Soviet journalists with whom I was personally friendly. Pro-Soviet? Yes. They were idealistically minded leftists who uh, made several visits to USSR. And yet, the KGB decided that come revolution or drastic changes in political structure of India, they will have to go. Why is that? Because they, they know too much. Mm -hmm. Simply because, you see, the useful idiots, the, the leftists who are idealistically believing in the beauty of Soviet socialist or communist or whatever system, when they get disillusioned, they become the worst enemies. That's why my KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. Forget about these political prostitutes. Aim higher. This was my instruction. Try to get into, into uh, large circulation established conservative media. Reach filthy rich movie makers, intellectuals, so-called academic circles. Cynical, egocentric people who can look into your eyes with angelic expression and tell you a lie. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or too uh, suffer from self-importance. Uh, they feel that uh, they, they matter a lot. Uh, these are the people who KGB wanted very much to recruit. But or, to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be no, the ones they, they rely they on? they serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, the, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists. When most of the Indians who were cooperating with the Soviets, especially without uh, the Department of of uh, information of the USSR embassy were listed for execution. Uh, and when I discovered that fact, of course I was sick. I was mentally and physically sick. I thought that I, I'm going to explode one day during the briefing at the ambassador's office. I would stand up and say something that we are basically a bunch of murderers. That's what we are. We, it has nothing to do with friendship and understanding between the nation and blah, blah, blah. We are murderers. We behave as a bunch of thugs in, in a country which, which is hospitable to us, a country which, which with ancient traditions. But I, I, I did not defect. I tried to get the message across to my horror. Nobody wanted even to listen, least of all to believe what I had to say. And I tried all kinds of tricks. I would, I would, I would uh, leak information through letters uh, or lost documents or something like that. And still I got no message. Uh, the message was not published even in the conservative mass media of, of India. The immediate impulse to defect was Bangladesh crisis, which was described by American correspondents as Islamic grassroots revolution, which is absolute baloney. Uh, there was nothing to do with Islam, and there was no grassroots revolution. Actually, there are no grassroots revolutions, period. Any revolution is a byproduct of a highly organized group uh, of conscientious and professional um, um, organizers, but it has nothing to do with grassroots. In Bangladesh, it was nothing with grassroots. Most of the uh, Awami League party members, Awami League means People's Party, uh, were trained in Moscow in the high party school. Most of the Mukti Fauj leaders, Mukti Fauj in Bengali means People's Army, same as SWAPO and, and all kind of liberation armies all over the world, the same bunch of useful idiots. They were trained at Lumumba University and various centers of the KGB in Simferopol, in, in Crimea, and in Tashkent. So when I saw that India, Indian territory is being used as a, as a jumping board to destroy East Pakistan, I saw myself thousands of, of so-called students traveling through India to East Pakistan, through the territory of India, 
and Indian government pretended not to see what was going on. They knew perfectly well, the Indian police knew it, the intelligence department of Indian government knew it, the KGB of course knew it, and the CIA knew it. That, that was most infuriating because when I defected and I explained to the CIA debriefers they should watch out because East Pakistan is going to erupt any moment. They said I, 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 was, I was reading too, too many James Bond novels. Anyway, so East Pakistan was doomed. Uh, one of my colleagues in, in the Soviet consulate in Calcutta, when he was dead drunk, he ventured into the basement to, to relieve himself. And he found that big boxes which said printed matter to Dhaka University. Dhaka is the capital of East Pakistan. And since he was drunk and curious, he opened one of the boxes and he discovered not printed matter. He discovered Kalashnikov guns and ammunition in there. Anyway, it's a long story. When I saw the, the preparations for the, for the uh, invasion into East Pakistan, obviously I wanted to defect immediately. The only thing I couldn't, I couldn't at that time uh, make up my mind when and where and how. One of the reasons, of course, you see, I was in love with India. I mentioned that before. I spoke the languages. I socialized with people. And I understood that I had to, to act fast unless I want this beautiful country to be permanently and irreparably damaged by our presence. Welcome.